Good afternoon, everyone. We will officially begin uh, the meeting of the Cook County Commission on Social Innovation. Uh, today is uh, June 8th. Um, it's our June meeting. Um, and we will officially call the meeting to order. Okay. So just for the record, we have here with us today, um, Chairman uh, Lane, Vice Chairman Lane. We have um, ex-official Dr. Predicles. We also have uh, Commissioner Durloff is with us online and also Freeman is online, Commissioner Freeman. So I'm just uh, jotting this down. Freeman. Okay, Commissioner DeBose is here, and then we have Commissioner Cooley is also with us today, and then Chairman Anaya. Okay, so we'll begin um, officially with the public testimony. Um, so uh, just to, for the record, uh, public testimony requests or any written comments can be submitted up to 24 hours in advance of the meeting to 7th district.office at gmail.com. That again is the number 7, T-H-D-I-S-T-R-I-C-T dot office at gmail.com. So can I get a notification either from Irene if we had anybody officially sign up for the meeting to testify or to provide written testimony? Um, no written Testimonies were submitted. Okay, for the record, we did not receive any requests. Um, we will move on to the minutes. Um, we do not have a quorum present at the moment, so we cannot approve the minutes of um, May, but they are in your packet. Uh, feel free to send us any um, edits that uh, you see on here so we can make the correction and make sure to file correctly. Um, also want to acknowledge that uh, Commissioner Asochi uh, Flores, Bureau Chief um, has just um, arrived, so she is here present um, in the room. So what we'll do is I will turn it over to Vice Chair Lane, um, who will give us some background on our presenter today um, and uh, any updates. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Pleasure to be with all of you on this uh, summerish day. May it continue and expand. Um, it's a great tea, uh, treat for me to uh, introduce our witness this afternoon, uh, Dr. Selwyn O. Rogers, Jr., who's a widely respected surgeon and researcher, um, has uh, an extraordinary um, birth at uh, University of Chicago Medicine and Biological Sciences. He is a professor and chief of trauma and acute care surgery. Uh, he is the James E. Bowman, Jr., M.D., professor in the biological sciences. He is the director of the Trauma Center, and he's executive vice president of community health engagements, all of which is very relevant to work that uh, one of our working groups is uh, deeply involved in. We'll be getting to that a little later in the, in the uh, meeting, but uh, today uh, we welcome Dr. Rogers, who is going to share with us his wisdom and insights around uh, intentional violence as seen through the uh, lens of public health. And he's uh, you know, one of the world's experts on these subjects. And uh, we have here in Chicago a microcosm of uh, opportunities to view, review, and reflect upon the societal problems that those represent. Uh, so, Dr. Rogers, pleasure to be, have you with us today, and I'll turn the, uh, the forum over to you. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner and I, Vice Chair Lane, uh, thank you for this opportunity uh, to testify before you this afternoon. Um, I think you said the key word, opportunity. I see tremendous opportunity. It's like the contract in which we see the world here in the great city of Chicago. Um, I joined uh, Chicago uh, a little over six and a half years ago, and um, it's been a whirlwind, to say the least. Um, but I'm going to dive in uh, with the hope that in 
25 minutes or so, I can uh, share my perspectives, but hopefully we can spend the bulk of our time on what we're gonna do about it, i.e. policy. So uh, I really can't talk about intentional violence without framing it as a public health challenge. And largely, I hope to give a background of this work as I see it, a background of this problem as I see it. Use use problem medicine that I know intimately as a case study of the problem and opportunity. Frame this as a social determinants problem that we can't just simply use one approach. We have to use an intersectional approach. And you'll see I have one and two, and you'll like you'll understand in a few minutes why I have it framed that way. And then finally, what do we or what can we consider doing about it? And I look forward to this dialogue. So by way of background, you can't tell a story about trauma, violence in the city of Chicago without Benjamin Benji Wilson. Um, you may, what, what we'll do is, um, is there a way that you can share your screen? Oh, it's not, absolutely. I, it's not coming up on our end. So okay. just want to make sure that um, me, folks online can see your presentation. Okay. Thank you. Um, I may need some technical assistance. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Screen. There you go. Okay. Oh, we got it. Sure. Okay. How about now? Is it visible? It's loading, yes. And then if you want to put it as a full screen. I am a surgeon. I'm not a technical <laughs> I would never have done all those steps. <laughs> but thank you. No problem. We'll go back to one slide with um, Benji Wilson. One more. Is there a way to zoom it up, Irene? Yeah. That's cool. Are there slides there? Can we go slide show now? Okay. okay. We're good to go. You could just press that turn. Okay. So nice. Very good. After we can. Um, we'll, uh, and really quick, before we um, yes. continue, I just want to acknowledge that uh, Commissioner Brutus just joined us here. And then we also have uh, our senior advisor, great um, extraordinary, extraordinary um, and all economic development. And um, uh, Howard Mills is also on the line uh, virtually with us. So thank you for joining us. And we'll turn it back. Thank you. So, so since there was a technical glitch and there, there are those in the room and I mean, not in the room uh, virtually, um, live stream and um, very fast forward. I was told by Vice Chair Lane that I have all the time in the world, but I don't. Um, intentional violence seen through a public health lens is what we'll talk about. I want to give background because I think uh, without knowing a little of history or at least level setting history, it's hard to move forward. Uh, use where I currently work, use Chicago Medicine as a case study of the problem of intentional violence. And then frame this as a social determinants of violence problem, which there's an act one and act two. And then finally, uh, where I hope that we can have the dialogue around policy recommendations. Um, and these are uh, my opinions, um, since I was asked to provide expert opinion, but I look forward to the dialogue. No, no story about uh, violence in the city of Chicago uh, can ignore this 18 year old black teenager, um, Benji Benjamin Wilson, who um, was shot after leaving high school with his then girlfriend in the middle of school. Uh, he was going out to a store to have something to eat. Uh, he and his girlfriend were talking and in somewhat an absent-minded fashion, the story goes, he bumped into uh, another teenager, another black male teenager. 
And what normally would have been probably, sorry, man, and kept on going, escalated and the six, eight um, recruited by Indiana, Illinois, DePaul at that time, but DePaul was pretty darn good, um, but was going to the show because he had that figure of talent to be drafted in the NBA. And you can see he had the number one in his hand. He was likely going to be a number one draft pick of some team in the NBA. Well, that interaction led to two shots, one in the back, one in the groin. And because at the time, Chicago Fire Department, Police Department, EMS, Emergency Medical Services, took patients who were severely injured to the nearest hospital. He was taken to St. Bernard's, which is, as everyone knows, a community hospital. And uh, this event happened midday. It took several hours before Benji was in the operating room, despite the fact that he was in hemorrhagic shock, bleeding to death. And unfortunately, despite the efforts of the surgeon, he died. Um, this is the young man who was the Michael Jordan of his time. Um, and his funeral drew over 10,000 people, I'm told. Um, his life led to changes. Uh, Illinois Department of Public Health and Chicago Department of Public Health made policy decisions that if someone's most severely injured and will be picked up by a EMS service, they have to be taken to the level one trauma hospital. That was age appropriate. See, the Chicago at 16 and below, the pediatric trauma center, 16 and above, you go to an adult trauma center. That's relevant because of what happened in 2010, August 15. Another 18 year old black teenager, Damien Turner, just weeks away from his 19th birthday, a uh, young man who was a social activist at the time, advocating for uh, rent control on the south side of Chicago, four blocks from the hospital that I work, a hospital that does and did at the time liver transplants, cardiac surgery, complex cancer surgery. And because of the rule that going to the nearest trauma hospital as verified by the state of Illinois, he was taken nine miles away to Northwestern where he died. His mother, quote, my sweet baby could still be alive today if the U of C had a trauma center just down the street. Mm. That led to a compelling series of events, largely driven by the community that was involved with groups, young, often teenagers, young people advocating for a trauma center now on the south side of Chicago, specifically at the University of Chicago Medicine. And what was driving that? It was this graph. Now, this is all the way back in August of 2014. Sadly, not much has changed. Uh, you don't need to be a geospatial analyst to see that there's a hyper concentration of shootings in the city of Chicago, predominantly in the south and the west side of the city. There is an interesting oasis in Hyde Park, which is where I live, where the University of Chicago is, where there are very few incidents of shootings in this area, but literally right around it. There are hundreds of shootings over the past decade. If you had a chance to look at this map with any degree of specificity, you would see that the trauma centers scattered. But at the time, the University of Chicago Medicine only had a pediatric level one trauma center that took victims of trauma up to the age of 16 years of age. So there was a significant trauma desert or donut hole on the south side of Chicago with respect to the care of traumatically injured patients nearest to a trauma center. And this problem persists. And whenever I show a slide of the number of homicides in the city of Chicago, I always have to reinforce that homicides are the tip of the iceberg. Because homicides are those people who succumbed and died 
from a firearm related injury. There are three or four people shot who don't die, who survive, but have to live on with the impact of a bullet or bullets traversing their body. Chicago hovered in the low 400s, mid 400s, every once in a while above 500 for almost a decade, although it has been more than 40 years since Chicago dipped below 400 homicides in a year. <laughs> but in 2016, there was a dramatic change. There were 764 homicides in the city of Chicago. I arrived uh, to stand up the Level One Trauma Center after community activism in 2017, January of 2017. But a year before I arrived, 764, the year of my arrival, 245. I'm sorry, 645. So I'm going to go a little deeper because I think U Chicago, Madison, the South Side of Chicago is a great example of why this problem is so seemingly intractable, seemingly intractable. Context, one third of Chicago's homicides and foul crimes occur within five miles of New Chicago Medicine. New Chicago Medicine closed its adult trauma center in 1989. At the time, there was, for those in the room, many of whom, whom were here, there was a, another adult trauma center on the south side at Mike Reese Hospital. In 1991, the year that I actually started my surgical training, that closed. It closed and there was no adult level one trauma center remaining on the south side of Chicago for the next 27 years. The homicide rate in the five mile catchment area around the of Chicago is three times the rest of Chicago. And there's another statement around the hyper endemic nature of violence in the city of Chicago. There's some communities where it's rare and there's some communities, communities where it's hyper endemic. It was really the community that pushed the University of Chicago Medicine, and that says something about the power of community. Youth groups like Phyllis Leading by the Youth, Stop, South Side Together, Organizing for Power, many community activists working together pushed the university, and that also included University of Chicago undergraduate students, professors, community members, civic organizations, church-based organization working for Common Goal Trauma Center now. And the Trauma Center now is largely driven by this reality. The reality is if you're the most severely injured, that is you're acutely bleeding from being hit by a car or a train or stabbed or shot, time is life. But the longer it takes to get bleeding to stop, the more likely you are to die. And before the advent of the University of Chicago Medicine's Trauma Center, this is what a map of the 77 county communities, neighborhoods in Chicago looks like. You can see the green in this case, for those who are not colorblind, is good. It's where your distance to a level one trauma center is the shortest. Red is bad, it's where the distance is the longest. And you can see that those who live in the south side, compared to every other place in the city of Chicago, had a longer transport time to get to a level one trauma center for their age appropriate. This is what happened after the University of Chicago Defense Trauma Center opened, largely driven by geography. The University of Chicago sits in the south side of Chicago. Now, it doesn't address the far south side, and I know there are representatives, commissioners who are arguing or advocating for um, sending them further south, and that's not the topic of today's conversation. But you can see the difference that that has made, at least for the distance. We're currently doing some work to quantify life saved. 
It's time to set open May 1st, 2018. We just celebrated our fifth year. The word celebrate is probably the wrong word. Commemorated. And the University of Chicago has this mission statement. This trauma center has this mission statement. Within it, there's only one word beyond prepositions and connectors that appears more than once. The word community. Trauma center, the University of Chicago Medicine is a resource for the community. And with partnership with our community, we hope to lead in discovery, education, and advocacy for those who are victims of violence, extending from prevention to recovery. Not expand upon that. This is the trauma faculty. You don't need to memorize their names. They're, in my mind, heroes that walk among us, meeting people on the worst days of their life. Why do I say that meeting people on the worst days of their life? This graph does not do justice to what we see every day. When we opened this level one trauma center in 2018, we saw 3,000 trauma activations. And if you drew a line, try to look at growth, this is the type of growth that you don't want to see. It also sense that there's Time, space, variation. Every May, there is an uptick. And every January, there's a downtick. And that pattern is repeated year after year, except the numbers keep rising. And one of the things that I came to University of Chicago Medicine's trauma center, the opportunity that I saw is standing up a level one trauma center at a research and technical university with the goal to make the trauma center obsolete. I think that the primary thing that we all want to do as trauma surgeons is to save lives. The best way to save lives is for people never to be injured in the first place. But this persistent 34 to 40 percent, sometimes 41 percent of the victims of trauma in South Side Chicago that come to the University of Chicago is because of the shock. The number one reason to be admitted to the trauma center in the University of Chicago Medicine is that you have been the victim of firearm related injury. This is the highest in the United States of America. For a single trauma center. We group it as blunt. Most places in the country, the number one reason is a fall. Someone falls out of bed, they fall the ladder, they fall. Second most reason is a car accident or a vehicle collision. Way down on the list, most trauma centers hover in the five to eight percent that the cause being admitted to the trauma center is having been shot. This city covers 40%. So in the five years, one month, we've seen over 22,000 trauma activations, which corresponds to over 8,000 people shot in the city in five years that have been cared for and cured about the English Chicago Medicine Trauma Center. That's the problem. That's the opportunity that we're here to discuss today. We talk a lot about the vector, be it the gun, AR-15, AK-47, the handgun. But let's go upstream. What's driving? Social determinants of health, one, the conditions that people live, work, play, pray every day drives your health outcomes. In this great city of Chicago, Chicago called home, the average life expectancy right here where we sit, if you live in Streeterville, is 85 years of age, average. Where I work, my office is literally across, I can look over to the, to the Sabo Museum of African History. 
Washington Park, 69 years age of life expectancy. She doesn't say anything about the quality of one's life, just as the longevity of one's life. Everyone in this room, everyone on the video knows that 85 slash 69 does not equal eight parentheses seven. These numbers are symbols. 85 life expectancy, one locale, 69 life expectancy, another locale, eight miles separating those two distances, seven stops on the L train. What are these social determinants of health? <clears throat> it's where we live, where we work, where we worship, where we play, where we age, where we love, and where we die. And it's a wide range of factors that are modifiable. Economic stability, educational access and quality, social and community context, healthcare access and quality, neighborhood and built environment. When we often think about trauma, when most people think about trauma, they focus on the middle box. Something traumatic happens, fall, install, gunshot wound, stabbing, car accident. We actually like to call them car collisions because it's never really an accident, especially in the day and age that we're all texting and driving and other distracted forms of driving. But we focus on pre-hospital care with emergency medicine services or Chicago without incredible firefighters and police department guys. Focus a lot on what happens once you cross the threshold into the trauma bay. A lot about operations and interventional radiology and nurses and team members working together to save a life. And we talk a little bit about what happens when people leave the hospital a little bit about rehabilitation and maybe some about recovery. But if anyone in this room was ever injured in any way and required a visit to the trauma center, you would want everything in your power to get back well enough, healthy enough to sit in the chairs that you're sitting in today and do the things that you want to do with your life. We hardly ever talk about or see a linkage between the built environment and people's lived experiences and how those upstream determinants of what happens that day that changes your life to be traumatically injured, especially by a bullet first in your body. Who are these victims of violence in this great city of Chicago? I'll turn your attention to figure five, which is the far right and on the screen. That represents citywide shooting victimization for 1,000 residents over the period of time, August 2017 to July 2020, near Chicago Crime Lab and the Chicago Police Department. In this particular case, uh, for schematic reasons of the 77 neighborhoods, you want to be blue. And I don't mean liberal. Or Democrat, I just mean you want to be in a blue neighborhood. Yellow neighborhoods, red neighborhoods have a higher rate of firearm related injuries. Again, the social superimpose and the geography of Chicago. North, few incidents. West, more. South, more. And superimpose this on the same life expectancy graph driven again by social determinants of health. Dark blue, worse life, life expectancy compared to light blue. And in superimposed that graph by economic hardship. Dark green, higher unemployment, lower rates of graduation from high school, lower rates of college degrees, lower income. I broke it up specifically from way upstream to what happens after someone's gotten injured. Because that's where I am. I'm in the trauma bay, I'm in the trauma OR, I'm in the ICUs, I'm in the hospital. I can't control what happened the minute before someone gets shot. 
but I can do everything I can once they're here. Once they're here and with us, one of the things that comes up often, and we've been at the Trauma Center at New Trauma Medicine for five years, being in the gap. One of the more dramatic experiences for me here in Chicago is doing everything I could operatively to save a life where a patient was injured by a bullet injuring the major blood vein, draining the legs, entering the abdomen in fear of being a cable, often a deadly injury. The patient went to the upper room, team of people working studiously together to save his life, which we did. He was discharged. And you think you did a good job. We got him out of the hospital. What a great save. One month later, patient comes in, muscle gunshot wounds. We look, do the thing that we know what to do. Leads to blood on our shoes, blood all over the trauma bay. He dies. After that, we say, why does this man have staples? It is a normal habit. And when we reconcile his record, we talk to his family. It's the same guy. We've been shot again. Now again. How do we fail the syllabus? Or how do we prevent re injury? This is a survival curve where people who've been shot once and only once, top line, the dark line, over time at the University of Maryland, which has been a trauma center, shock trauma, trauma center, one of the iconic trauma centers in the country for decades. In fact, Cook County was the very first trauma center in the United States organized as such. Shock trauma followed Cook County in terms of the model of being focused on taking care of special trauma patients. Over a 10-year period, they collected their data and followed patients over a decade to see what happened to them. Those people who have been shot once and only once, top line, better survival. If you've been shot more than once, meaning more than one occasion, separated in time, not the number of bullets that traverse your body at any given time, but episodes of being victim shooting, your survival is remarkably decreased. That presents an opportunity at the hospital level, at the intervention of the trauma center level for what we call secondary prevention. How can you use that moment to alter the trajectory of someone's life so they're not on the bottom curve, they're on the top curve? And that's been the advent for the past 20 years, increasing professionalization, but more organized in the past 15 years. Hospital based <clears throat> violence recovery programs, which is a set of wraparound services taking the victims of violence, especially firearm related injuries, and wrapping around services in an individualized fashion to meet their needs, which are often social needs. How does it work? Basically, you take the intervention, you take the teachable moment, if you will, the captured moment. They're recovering in the hospital, build trusting relationships. Your care is not just focused on the medical, the surgical, as well focus on holistic recovery. And you connect people with services that they often would have lack of agency to connect with. They may not even know that these services exist. And these services basically involve an assessment of what the needs of the patient are, catalog those needs, connect them with a set of services to meet them, their needs, and follow them over time to make sure those connections stay. This is really, really, really hard work. Harder work than being a trauma surgeon. 
It's what we like to call the civilian architecture. Blue that keeps people connected. And we will define that as two, in two different buckets. So there's interpersonal determinants and violence, largely this issue of how can we actually prevent retaliatory violence, break at least in the moment the cycle of violence. That's a whole host of community-based organizations doing street outreach work, communities partnering for peace, Chicago Crowd, Super Nonviolent Chicago, Activist, IMAN, Calgary Area, VPs. These are just some of the ones that we are working with at New Chicago Medicine in partnership. The more trickier part is the social determinants. And I, I shouldn't say both are tricky because you know, it involves people and complexity and the muck of life. But the other part is the social determinants of violence, which are actually pretty hard to fix because it's the same social ills that drive 30 year life expectancy gap between one community and another community in the great city of Chicago. And a whole host of community and county organizations work together, ideally, to affect change in the social services network, or what I'll call the civilian architecture. We can talk about that some more. Community level partnerships work, it's hard work, but they work. We just need to figure out how to make them work better. At the scale. So here are my final policy recommendations as I close. Just because it's hard doesn't mean that we shouldn't do it. The price is currently incalculable. The lost human potential, unbelievable. And I would humbly say intolerable. So these are my opinions. Secondary prevention. How can we promote the civilian architecture? We can have a robust conversation about that. And I saw it today, but I do think that we need to think about how do we create social cohesion and move people where they are, provide the resources they need, maximize their human potential. Specifically at the county level, we need to expand and support churches, hospitals. Community violence intervention program. I'm not deep in the space to know much about Stroger's specific program, but we need to do more with it. The other is many of the room may know the Victims of Crime Act, which is a reimbursement model for those who are victims of violence and their families, up to about $40,000 per individual here in the, the state of Illinois. But it's a model where you have to pay for the service and then get reimbursed for the service. Um, I can write a check, but not everyone can. And those who often are the least of these can't. Not only do, do, they, do they not have access or agency, or knowledge, they just don't have the dollars to do so. So can we create a fund where people can tap into the fund and the fund gets reimbursed by local funding? Former Mayor Lightfoot started a program in December of 2022 in five communities, Garfield, West Garfield, Park, uh, Inglewood, West Inglewood, and New City as a pilot program to provide immediate relief, financial relief, for victims of violence, for funeral services, other immediate needs. I think we should actively think about ways of expanding that program beyond the pilot in five communities. And then finally, for secondary prevention, how can we promote infrastructure to facilitate temporary assistance for needy families? There's a lot of there's an experiment going on now on living wage. Isn't that about living wage or guaranteed income? It's about just meeting basic needs that people have to be able to remain housed and fed. What's tougher, harder, 
more intentional and need to plan is continuing to invest in the south and west of the city of Chicago, improve primary education for all. Many of us had great primary education, great opportunities, great mentorship that helped us stand on the shoulders of others to be in this space. I'm personally, a, I'm a strong proponent of early childhood education. I know there was a, a bill that, a law that Governor Christopher put in place, Mark. Mark, help me. Mark, what's the oh, yes. Smart, smart, smart. Smart. Yes, smart one. Hmm. I can't remember the next word. Anyway, but just yesterday, I think, right? Um, promoting early childhood education. You know, I think that's foundational. And it takes a long time, right? When a third grader is behind on their math and reading, how likely, how easy is it for them to catch up? In the space that I get to work with respect to patients, the mental health needs are through the room mm. of everyone. And it is not post-traumatic stress disorder. It's present toxic stress disorder. The lives of people lead every day. When people tell me their stories, I say, how do you get up in the morning? How do you function? How do you say it goes to school with all of that heaviness? <clears throat> And then I think we really, I, I'm not going to delay to this because I'm not a, um, I'm not an attorney nor am I, a, I'm just a simple surgeon trying to make a difference every day. Sure, our police department could send decrees on the table, how do we enforce it? And I would go one step further. How can we invest in our police officers doing everything they can every day to ensure our safety? And make their part to make our community safer. But without trauma-informed policing, lots of decisions get made really quickly with lots of consequences for the entire state. This is my last slide as I wrap up. Um, I think you can't have policy without tactics and without goals, tactics and goals. Uh, we got to improve coordination across sectors because this is more intersectional education, economic, healthcare access, and home security, all of that and more. But like anything else, you got to have a plan. And without coordination across sectors, sectors will be really against each other. Second, you have to commit to the long term outcome. It's not about today, it's not about next week, it's not about next year, it's about long haul, long game. And we got to remain steadfast. We can't accomplish any goals without having one. You got to set goals. You got to know that you're getting closer. And if you're not, change tactics. And then finally, this is something that I've particularly been struck by in Chicago in my six years. And again, I'm an outsider trying to do good every day. When those who remember the physics, when vectors are not perfectly aligned, they cancel each other out. And so good people doing good things every day, but not the scale, and not aligned, do not lead to the maximum benefit. So we have to have all in policies working synergistically. They're very really good. We're often the least of these. So quoting Daniel Burnham, one of my heroes. Devil in the White City, great book, movie coming out this summer. Not that I'm out of time. Make no little plans. They have no magic in them. To still their blood and being inclusive. Thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. And I will. Commissioners, who among you would like to begin? Commissioner Brutus, please. 
thank you, Vice Chair. Um, thank you for your presentation, Doctor. Very, uh, very informative. It's uh, smart to start. Thank you. <laughs> I had a brain cramp there. Yeah, I actually looked it up. Um, th there is just uh, so much to unpack there. So much to unpack there. Um, Third question I'll just ask, uh, maybe others, so I'm going to go back, but I'll ask this one. Um, beyond the trauma center that the university um, opened, and I will say that it was very innovative to use a garage facility uh, to locate that there. Uh, what more? Right. What more is the university doing as a campus, uh, as a UCMC, as a you know, um, what is the university doing to uh, further try to mitigate the alarming numbers of um, uh, victims with gun death, incident coming into the hospital within the hospital radius? in that community that the hospital surveyed? Well, thank you, Commissioner, for that question. I, I would say that I don't have all the answers. And, uh, you know, I, I have some of the answers in terms of what is actively being done. For example, the Office of Civic Engagement that's now been led by Christian Mitchell. Um, there has been increasing attempts to invest locally, both in terms of employment as well as buildings, programs, contracting, minority-owned business, et cetera. That's one strategy at the Netflix Center, our Urban Health Initiative, which is a further public health arm, um, led by Brenda Battle, has been um, working diligently, but challenged by the scope of the problem. And I have given you a fair bit about trauma, but there's also pediatric death, and there's also obesity, and there's also undiagnosed renal failure. Twenty-nine-year-old black man comes in shot, and the blood pressure is one sixty over one hundred, which is high. The creatinine is abnormal, which shouldn't be at twenty-nine. We have forty-year-old black people showing up with end-stage renal disease. Because they've never seen a doctor for the diabetes or hypertension or anything else. And so until we fix that, this healthcare disparities persist. And going back to all in, it really is an all-in problem. It's not just the health system problem, right? Four walls of the trauma center or the emergency department doesn't fix that. Got to get way upstream. I'm going to turn it back to you. What should we be doing jointly with you to address these needs? No, I, I agree that the um, some of the solutions need to be shared by community and the university as the primary stakeholder in community. However, I do like the idea that the university does fund a number of the stakeholder groups in and around Washington Park, Woodlawn, West Woodlawn, et cetera. Um, and I am, you know, I continue to re remain encouraged by the um, the Emerald South uh, addition of, you know, groups that are also in the South Shore area yes. and further west. It is, um, you know, I, I'm excited about the Cancer Center that's coming, you know. Um, Bob, 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 the library. Yeah, you'll be there. I'm sure you'll be there. Um, yeah, but I think it needs to be shared, and that's, a, that's another level of work that needs to be um, uh, undertaken to promote healthy foods. And um, you know, I'm glad that you talked about the built environment. I do work for the city of Chicago, I'm in the plant department. Um, so you know, I hear they give a little planner eye on you. So it's good to know that you're also, you know, um, factoring those considerations and some of the overall you know, issues and solutions about how do we, you know, create a healthy environment. Uh, it's not just public health, it's community health, it's, it's everything, right? It's, you know, economic development, it's job creation, it's affordable housing, it's, you know, clean air, it's healthy, you know, vacant lands, lots, it's you know, community gardens. It's, it's a recipe of all things, right? You know? 
Yeah. Um, yes, your right to to um, to ask the you know the equal question is what is the community doing as well? And so there's a lot of work there. Um, and I'll, I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. Who else would like to uh, ask a question or make a comment? So, Commissioner DeBow, please. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Owen. <clears throat> um, yeah. Press it again, and I'll make sure that there's a green button. Um, I mean, the green light right here. Yeah. There you go. Thank you, so much. Excellent presentation. Um, I want to hone right in on one of your policy recommendations. Um, we as a commission actually are looking at a project. And so this is a beautiful opportunity to get your perspective on this. So, you know, one of the things you really emphasize, the you know, violence intervention programs that connect to the trauma center. This is exactly what we're looking at the county hospital and trying to figure out, and some of them have talked about this, but trying to figure out how we can, um, as a commission, work with the Cook County Health Foundation that funds um, fund services related to the hospital for folks in the county. You know, how we could um, help in exactly this regard. So I think, you know, if we could just, if you could wave, you know, you're a different trauma hospital, but um, obviously many of the conditions are the same. So if you could kind of wave a wand from your role and what you see as we get ready to now go in and speak with hospital personnel and see what's helpful and the whole is to be constructed and build around what exists already. So if you could, you know, in that vein, if you could wave a wand and say, in terms of you know violence intervention programs that extend out the reach of the hospital to take care of folks as they go back into the community, hopefully present or prevent recidivism and build much, much better um, care on a continuing basis. What what would those things look like? Like what should we be thinking about? What should we be taking in? Uh, thank you, Commissioner DeVoe. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start by saying it's complicated, right? But it was complicated to get a man, it could have been a woman, but it was a man who moved in less than a decade and it happened. So we can do it. We have to have the will to do so. But addressing the question specifically, you got to start with these decision. What do the victims of violence need? And do that with humility. Not, I know the answer. What do they need? Now, you have to do it in a way that actually doesn't get you blown off. That is, I'm not telling you what I need because I don't trust you. So it has to do with cultural humility. But what are the needs of the victims of violence? So that's the needs assessment problem. Then you got to go with what's the gap analysis to get them from where they are to where they need to be. That's the second comment. You also have to have, in my opinion, an individualized plan because what works for one person, but it's not going to work for the next person. All that that just said takes resources. But we should not be overwhelmed by the resources that are needed because the current Reality is, we're all paying for what's going on. The price is being cashed every day, multiple times a day, in multiple different ways, and in a overall sense way. We're paying for it with a sense of not being safe. And so, specifically, hospital based violence intervention program, there is a, there's a bit of a blueprint. A blueprint. Uh, the Health Alliance for Violence Intervention National Organization is intentionally trying to professionalize this work and has a playbook, a toolkit, uh, job restrictions, a whole bunch of stuff to try to standardize this work. So I think that's a great place to start. The second is we have to think differently about violence. Specifically, you would never have a heart attack. Not that I'm sure I'm your way. But you would never have a heart attack. Come in overweight without health insurance, without 
a active lifestyle without smoking. You got all those are risk factors for another heart attack. And we wouldn't put a $20,000 stent in you and give you antiplatelet therapy and send you on your way without addressing those risk factors. So without addressing the risk factors, mitigating the risk factors, that's the overall goal of violent intervention. How do you identify protective factors in people's lives and adaptive factors in people's lives and risk factors that you try to lessen? And for some people, that means leaving the city of Chicago, which is actually a bad thing from a social connectedness perspective, because this is your tribe, this is your family, this is all that you know. But for some people, that's what has to happen, unfortunately, which is sad. But is there other ways to lower the risk and increase the protection? That's what the county board should be funding, supporting. And then the last bit, you gotta measure it. How do you know it's working? Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Thank you for the presentation. Very informative. Um, question for you. I think about um, recently, Derek Douglas and the Civic Committee, previously University of Chicago, um, stated Civic Committee really wants to engage private sector in addressing um, all the issues that we're now facing and linked very closely with your work. Have you given some thought of private sector engagement in this work and what does that look like? Thanks, thanks Greg. Great question. Um, given a lot of thought, don't completely have the access. So if you give me the access, I will give them my two cents. But here's the thing. If people don't feel safe, they don't come visit the city of Chicago and come to Babuza. They don't invest in the city with economic development. They move their companies from Chicago as headquarters. So the downstream impact of this problem, as big as it is, will only get bigger unless we change it. Thank you. I have a, I have a follow-up. I know, Commissioner, I know you have a question, but if I may just pick up on uh, this exchange. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed by your description of the all-in policies as tactics, and I, I would invite you to consider them as, as strategy, particularly in the context of what you're calling civilian architecture, where we have uh, community service providers and partners. And um, one of the ways the commission has had success over the years, in addition to incubating actionable social policy recommendations, turning them into ordinances, regulations, resolutions that have teeth in them, is uh, as serving as a convener, a collaborator, a catalyst. And I too view this as a multi-sectoral problem slash opportunity. And I think your last exchange kind of evidences that uh, pursuing social impact and making the business case, it's not a binary choice. One actually enforces the other, drives the other. So my question is, if we kind of look at the various sectors within the larger community and place it in the context of a new mayoral administration that is looking for ideas and is obviously um, challenged to address public safety issues. Uh, if we were to look at the private sector, the nonprofit community, the social enterprise community, um, the and governments at all levels, and were the commission to take on complementary to the important work that Commissioner DeBow and Commissioner Austin are leading, um, might, might we in fact uh, congregate thought leaders in the various sectors 
um, around these issues, around these problems, around these opportunities? And if so, how might you start thinking about an agenda for such a collectivity of, of, of players whose thought leadership we might leverage? Let's do it. Okay. I mean, I, I'm being parsimonious, right? I mean, clearly, you're, you're never parsimonious. I aspire to parsimony. <laughs> I'm, there's no short answer to that. I see. Right? Appreciate that. Um, um, and uh, I come from a place of um, radical humility. So I don't know. I'm willing to try. Okay. Is is it a is it a reasonable um, initiative for us to give thought to and start shaping? Or do you feel that? And 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 if so, would you see that as complementary to what Commissioner Debeau described in the on the ground work in terms of wraparound services and all the other things we're thinking about as far as county hospitals concerned? I, I absolutely do think that uh, it's complementary and and. It's a big problem. And I think it was Albert Einstein said, if you have a big problem, you can't need a bigger solution. Or or if you try to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different result, you're whatever. So I, I do think that that is the reality. A problem like this that is seemingly intractable, and it's not, because there are people, there are programs that are doing great work every day in this great city of Chicago, but not at scale and not with aligned vectors and not with a long range plan and deliberate goals with intentionality and key performance indicators to say we're making progress and scrap that because it's not making progress because it's not getting the goal. I'll ask you one follow up and then I will defer to others. You've been very generous to me and to others. Um, but taking you literally, uh, if we were to either create a, a working group around this very initiative or expand the pre-existing working group that looks at public safety and community wellness, is that something you'd be willing to work with us on? And might you, in fact, help recruit other people whose input could be useful to such an effort? Sign me up. Thank you. I, I, I deeply appreciate that. Thank you. I'm, I'm, Commissioner and I, I knew you had a question. Yes, no, um, I'm, I'm definitely seeing a trend here. Um, my question was very much aligned to uh, my chair name. Um, so I think um, it it's not um, uh, something super strange for us to really understand the fact that crime and gun violence in particular is such a, it seems like such a daunting task. It seems like such a huge, um, project to undertake. And I think part of the reason why there is a disconnect is that, um, in my opinion, it doesn't seem like, um, not that there's not a willpower, but it just seems so big for any particular either sector or level of government to really handle it. And I think the reality has become that we have come to the realization that it is going to take everyone and that it does need to uh, include conversations that maybe the different sectors are not used to having um, because it does impact everyone. I mean, we're downtown right now and, and you know that there's been a really difficult um, um, problem with getting you know people to come back downtown. So I, so I think um, with that said, and with us all here in the room and obviously online listening, we understand that. And I think um, my, my hope is to figure out like how do we dissect this issue and then all pitch in because everybody has been pitching in in different ways. You know, that Cook County has invested at this point over $100 million in violence prevention. They've done great work with CCH, um, but it's such a small thing in comparison to maybe some of the other hospitals and some of the other um, institutions um, and, and stakeholders, to be quite honest. So I'm wondering, do you have any set of advice for us as commissioners, um, as a commission, um, to really pitch this idea of hospital-based violence intervention programs. This is a great model. We understand, we believe that if it could work, it won't be the magic wand all, altogether because again, to, to your point, it, it, it is gonna take a lot um, from everyone. 
but what is how do we pitch this how is there any you, you talked about toolkit but is there any other um, information anything else that we can provide forward and have there been already conversations with maybe your counterparts of different areas of the city or the county thank you um <clears throat> Um, when I'm not sure. Um, there, there have been conversations. Um, it's often complicated working across health systems in this city because everyone sees the world through their lens and their silo. Um, but to the point that it's not just about a health system or a hospital, right? I mean, life expectancy in the South Side of Chicago is 69 years of age on average. It is a world-class medical center that sits right in the middle of that. So it's not just about access to world-class healthcare or lack of access, it's so many other things. Um, but I do think that hospitals, health systems can play a critical role, but often as a convener, because without your health, it's actually pretty hard to do anything, right? It's, if you're on dialysis with kidney failure, if you have bad lungs from smoking, if you, I mean, all those things cost the city real money and real lost potential. And if you go from conception to delivery of a premature kid, if we all pay for that because that child needs help for the rest of their life. And then I'm going to go really deep <clears throat> in my mind. We are losing generations of kids today because these kids are not maximizing their human potential and that's on us as adults watching over these kids and so when the kids don't feel loved and cared for cured out what do we expect is going to happen that's not an indictment of anyone in this room that's just my personal belief I pour deeply into my three boys. And they're 27, 24, and the baby turns 21, yes, tomorrow. I, I can't believe <laughs> that. But, and they're great. <clears throat> they're great because they got filled with love and they know it. That goes a long way to fixing this problem. Hard to do at some level, some of the challenges that we see today exacerbated by COVID is a lack of human connectedness. People don't know who their neighbor is next door. They don't know their names, they don't know their kids, they don't know their dog's name. I mean, it, it was so different when I was a kid, right? I knew everybody and everybody knew me. If I spit on the sidewalk before I got home, my mother knew I spit on the sidewalk. And that degree of social cohesion goes a long way for people to feel connected above and beyond my silo, my space, my block. And way too many people view this as my silo, my space, my block. That problem over there, not my problem. That's a them problem. We got to make this an us problem. Thank you. Um, and that, you I mean, even if we unpack that as well, it also talks a lot about um, the different, I mean, one of the best documentaries that I feel like in recent years that I've seen was this Cooked, that talks a lot about the life expectancy and the map overlay of the different poverty areas and how that, I mean, I think for a lot of families, um, it is difficult to make that connection. I know it come from a mother, single mother that had to be, you know, gone for a while. So, I mean, she instilled very great values, but I could see how it could be very difficult for families and how that becomes a cycle um, into our children. Um, I guess the, the last question um, thing that kind of the, this conversation has really brought forward to me um, out of curiosity, how, how do you think we need to engage um, public health officials and then just in general healthcare practitioners um, into policy making? Because you all are seeing um, you know, you're able to provide great um, maps and charts, um, and this is valuable, valuable information, I think, for policymakers. Um, so how do we engage more, more of you, uh, of you <laughs> uh, as healthcare pr practitioners and providers to be able to bring this forward and um, um, really mold policy and change on the different levels of government? You just did, you asked. 
we just want to be asked. We do a lot in the spaces that we occupy, and our time is limited. But if you ask, none of us want to take care of yet another 16 year old boy shot in the head. We don't. We really don't. But we do because it's a way to serve and to help others. But none of us wake up and say, you know what? I can't wait to sell that kid's it or, that, or take out that kid's spleen or take out that grown man's intestines. That's not what we wake up to do. We wake up and hope that none of that happens and every day I'll get sad. Thank Madam you. Chair, it's Howard. May I ask a question? Absolutely. Oh, thank you. Doctor, uh, very appreciative for your presentation, your time, and I know for your talent, most of all. But because we can't solve things in the immediate future, I'm looking to find out what you believe we have that works and what doesn't with respect to our trauma surgeon our trauma centers in the in in the county, uh, including yours, because you spoke uh, about your center and you collect data, of course, but I'm sure Cook County has data as well. And when you look at the medical surgical talent that we have, do we have enough to meet the need? Um, I know we never have enough money, but are we attracting the medical surgical talent to the city that we need and, and growing that talent? And are we able to meet this horrible demand that's so sad, but what do you see for us in the immediate future by way of service? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, uh, Commissioner. Um, Chicago is a great city. There's no challenge that I have experienced recruiting people, residents, medical students, faculty in Chicago. It's a beacon, right? There are some places it's really hard to recruit to. I'm not going to name it. This is not one of them. Um, you mentioned uh, not enough money. Sometimes it is about money, but it's not about the city or the opportunities in the city. I mean, I, I was just downtown with a friend last night, went to a restaurant, and we were talking, two hours go by. He wanted to keep talking. We walked down to the lake, we walked to the left. He wanted to go left, not go right. I wanted to go right, but we went to the left. We walked for another mile and people were out and enjoying the lake. And literally, I said to myself, you know, I could be in British Columbia, Charleston, South Carolina, LA on the beach. You gotta be near water. You know, sorry, all the places I just said are near big bodies of water. And I could transplant myself there and I couldn't tell the difference. Running, walking, families. It was a beautiful thing. But it was by the lake. What does it look like at the same time in Inglewood or West Garfield Park? And when I first came to Chicago, I don't, I don't want to belabor this, and Mark knows I'm too much of a storyteller. When I first got here, I was trying to get to know the city. I drove around a lot. And I was really struck that it was a tale of two cities after dark. You go some places in this great city within the 77 neighborhoods and you see nobody. And at the same time, you're down in the loop. It's happened on a weekday. What a different life experience depending on where you are walking. And we live. How can we normalize that? And that's not I'm not making a political statement. I'm just making a statement about the quality of one's life. Are there other comments or questions? Commissioner Brutus, you'll be our last, so yeah, make it a good yeah, one. I think you um, be last, but thank you. Um, Session here. Uh, before you are discharged, uh, <laughs> discharge. Uh, <we> <laughs> don't discharge me. <laughs> <laughs> Just 
we're looking at that one more time. I just wanted to write that down. Uh, the forty percent uh, visit for mm -hmm. the national average in the city. Yeah. Uh, so adult level one trauma centers, which are the highest level of trauma care, um, those are the places that the sickest of the sick preferentially go with respect to traumatic injuries. We have used Chicago again, driven by location. We don't, as you know, there's no billboard sign to come here, right? Just given our geography. 40% of our patients who come to your Chicago lesson for a traumatic injury because they've been shot. And here's a little bad news. They're not been shot once. They've been shot multiple times. So that's about it. Yeah, how acute and acuity we see. I I I I won't be too to tell you how many numbers I can get to at times. But the second is nationally. Boston, trauma center, ten percent. Mm. Wow. You did mention that the average was about anywhere between five and eight nation, it, nationwide. Nationwide, if you look across all trauma centers, and you, you got to also think a lot of this problem of firearm injuries are two different categories. It's community violence that we've been talking about, urban America. However, there's another thing that we don't talk about at all suicide. Mm. People over the age of 55 who are white, white males, kill themselves. There are more suicides by gun in this country than community violence. But because of our own mental challenges to talk about mental health, that's often silent and one-offs. So people don't see the toll that suicide has on this country. Yeah, and uh, Dr. Rogers, when he and I first spoke, decided to point out for me that I'm in the category of suicide. Uh, <laughs> so, and I thank him for that. I found that very inspiring. Hey, um, well, thank you so much for your time. Uh, I, I, I take your words as uh, a mandate. Uh, we all have here taken on a sacred duty and a responsibility and what can be more important than helping you save lives and to reduce the number of people that we expect you to save uh, so we're gonna we're gonna take you up on your unsolicited offer to uh, i think what's solicited actually <laughs> no it's entirely your idea um, <laughs> Your, your, your unsolicited offer to uh, collaborate with us, not only with respect to our existing working groups initiative, but I think also uh, the, the important uh, positioning we enjoy to recruit thought leaders from all sectors to sit down and leverage their thought leadership and spitball and brainstorm. And who knows what might come out of that, but at a minimum, uh, I think sensitizing them to the scope and depth of the problem and the role that they can carve out to help solve it, I think that in itself will be enormously useful and uh, beneficial to what we're all trying to achieve together. So thank you so much for that. And, uh, we're going to move on to the balance of the meeting. You are invited to stick around. I, I got discharged. <laughs> Your discharge has been revoked for bad behavior. Um, no, we'd love to have you stick around if you're if your game and if your time permits. If not, we certainly understand if you have to take off because we're going to move on to the regular business of the commission. But we have deeply appreciated your contribution, all that you've done here, all you do all day long, every day, and uh, the further contributions you'll be making to our work, which uh, I'm personally grateful to you for. Uh, for uh, agreeing to undertake. So thank you so much, Dr. Rogers. Good afternoon. Thank you. Yes. So um, I think the, please, uh, the, the natural segue here now uh, with the permission of the chair mm -hmm. is to move into the uh, reports of our working groups. 
And uh, obviously, uh, uh, Commissioner Alston who wants to say hello to Dr. Rogers, I see. And uh, Commissioner DeBow, uh, you started to tell, we have a celebrity in our midst, I see. <laughs> why is it that people who save lives automatically become celebrities in this society? Um, as well as should be, thank you. So uh, if uh, the working group on uh, public safety and community wellness would like to uh, offer a report on your progress. I know there has been some, and I know there are uh, some coming attractions you can preview for us, and we'd love to have you do that. And in so doing, I would invite the other commissioners uh, to pay, I know you always pay close attention, but pay even closer attention to what you might take on as this working group's work continues and expands, because obviously this is a subject of great importance to all of us individually, from a family point of view, from a community point of view. So uh, I don't know who wants to go first, but uh, Commissioner DeVoe, Commissioner Austin, the floor is yours and thank you for what you've done so far and we'd love to hear what it, that is. Well, I'd, I'd like to say- We need to get your, your mic on if you would please, Harry. Thank you. Yeah, great night. That, is that it? Yeah, you should, you're, you're good now, thank you. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to report that I've been very active on a lot of fronts, but that's not quite the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'll- well, you, know, you talk to a lawyer, you can fudge a little bit, it's okay. I don't think, <laughs> but there are some things I heard today that I think I will continue to follow up on, and, and some of my just kind of independent reaching out to folks. One is uh, around what um, Dr. Selma said about Smart, smart start and early education, and then some investigation around the impact of uh, guaranteed minimum uh, income. Uh, these things have been really affected in getting some of the social determinants of, of violence, and I've just been continuing to try to mine resources, uh, bring these forces to, to the table, and that. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, Dr. Rogers characterizes the social determinants of violence when we often hear the expression social determinants of health. Okay. But what's a what's a, a more important piece of one's health than avoiding violence? Well, so, you know, I think that you were dealing with a subset, but obviously probably the most critical subset. Well, actually, I was just talking to someone of the night. This is an editorial uh, comment, and that is, I'm beginning to feel like social determinants of health, social determinants of violence, social determinants of poverty are, are becoming jargon. Yeah. And, and the kind of coin of the realm. I think what we need to do is to stop throwing those terms around so vividly and, and get to work on, on some of those, those issues because they're all are formidable and, and focused on the main things that we look at, tales of two cities. And the same for urban and, and rural yeah. America. Yeah, yeah. Like it's that. too easy. It's too easy to get caught up in jargon and lose sight of the substance that you're trying to address. So I, I I thank you for your willingness to undertake some of these projects outside the scope of what we've historically talked about. And again, if I can be helpful to you as you pursue them, please let me know. And I invite other commissioners to either let Commissioner Alston or me know of your willingness to support that effort because this is, you know, not only comprehensive, but systematic gun rights. And uh, so I appreciate that. And Commissioner DeBoe, would you like to yeah, kind of uh, fill in? Yeah. The, um, we now have heard from Sylvia Sykes at the foundation that it looks like they're scheduling this hospital meeting at the trauma center in gym, right? Mark, she reached out to us, but we haven't heard dates. I mean, frankly, it's been, super transparent, it's been hard to get that moving. It probably has, because of the new- I did, by the way, speak with her after you did, and I'm speaking with her again tomorrow. Yeah. And she did express, one, her great enthusiasm about moving this initiative forward. And two, it's a case of kind of, you know, herding ducks. So, yeah. <laughs> so it's, really, it's really more logistics than a reflection of anybody's a yeah. uh, lack of support for what we're doing. I think there is enormous support for what we're trying to accomplish. Yeah, and it, you know, there's folks in new role that 
president and then yes. who's organizing this process. So I think it will happen. I think it will happen in June. You know, I just the only thing I guess I would add is to the, the good suggestion we had, Mark, of a convening. You know, there's a lot to potentially work with and build around from the hospital and from the Westside Health Collaborative. So there's a lot in place, you know, and there's there's wellness collaborators on the west side. Yeah, what, what I, I'm, I'm curious to learn what you, Wendy, and, and Harry, what you, how you think about this, but I'd like to seed such a conversation with, you know, kind of um, lessons we're learning, uh, directions we'd like to take things, and have that be kind of a, a, a an embryo around which we can build and grow this and really recruit all you're not going to recruit all the necessary desirable players, but at least representatives of the necessary and desirable players and, and secure their buy-in to this effort, which I think is the first step. Uh, you know, before we start figuring out what we do, we need to make sure we have the right players and those players are in fact committed to do what we've committed to do. So, so thank you for that. I greatly appreciate that. Maybe for the benefit of commissioners who haven't heard it or heard it recently, yeah. if you could take a moment to just explain again what it is we're seeking to accomplish at, at the hospital. Yeah. So we are working with the Cook County Health Foundation as a partner. It is the private entity that actually raises money and it probably raised several hundred thousand a year that is dedicated to helping um, sort of surround uh, patients at Cook County Hospital with various services basically leads to better health outcomes. Um, they, frankly, I think are looking to step up their impact game. Um, they're excited to partner with us. So we are together approaching the hospital and saying, um, exactly to the point of what Dr. Rogers raised today, that you know, one way to really improve health outcomes and try to address the cycle of trauma is to dedicate resources, really smart resources, enhance resources inside of the trauma center, inside of the trauma hospital, in a way um, doctor's care can then be extended into neighborhoods, into the community, through wraparound social services. So for example, they have case managers already there in the trauma center doing that, but they only have a few. Maybe they need more. Maybe need, they need more resources. Maybe you know, the idea of a victim's fund and reorganizing that in a way the victims will be better, maybe that's something that's helpful. So I think our goal is with the Cook County, the idea of having a hospital foundation with us is to help us raise money for this. So we would together try to work directly with the trauma center team and the hospital staff and Letty, who's the governor relations liaison who's organizing this, to sort of figure out how can we build around what they're doing. And I think Dr. Rogers' point of it starts with a needs assessment. I mean, that's a really, really good idea. Do they have any? Maybe they have one in place already. You know, hopefully they do. If they don't, is that step one? You know, would we want to help fund or create a needs assessment that's really community-based? And then look at where the gaps are. And from that say, you know, wow, here's here's a couple of more case managers, or here's more resources for wraparound social services that create connected tissue for when an individual and, and their family around them leave the trauma center, leave the trauma center and go back into community and have kind of a pathway and continued connection with health services, social services that change the cycle. So that's essentially. Yeah, thank you. And I, I agree that Dr. Rogers' observations about the steps we take and in, you know incremental uh, order are, are very important and logical because otherwise you just engage in a conversation, and nothing comes of it. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, well, yeah, very important. Uh, I'd like to move forward, if we may, um, Commissioner Cooley, if you might. Um, give us a report on what had been known as the Industrial Policy Working Group, and I believe has officially, or perhaps a little less than officially, now become the Community uh, Assets Working Group, looking at uh, market vacuums where entrepreneurial activities and disinvested communities might be created by the county, owned by the county, managed by the county. 
uh, to afford uh, residents of those communities access to goods and services that will lift those people up, lift up their families, uh, improve contributions to the tax base and all the rest. Uh, so I, I and, and thank you very much. You uh, very uh, generously shared with me a, a written report uh, about you know where you're headed and where you want to be headed. And I found that very useful. And to the extent that you would like to uh, share that with a larger group, I invite you to do so. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so we have not convened since the last meeting, but have had some conversation more on the side. But one thing, um, <coughs> Commissioner Thomas um, is not being able to serve in such a leadership role, so looking for another. Yeah, let, let, yeah let's, I was going to make kind of a right. separate okay. point on that, but let, since you've raised it, let me just mention uh, this is a really, really important working group, and it could deal with things like um, access to fresh produce in stores and local communities, potentially a public bank that invests in infrastructure in a local community. Um, we talked uh, about uh, electric vehicle charging stations in communities that otherwise would not command investment for that purpose, and all sorts of other efforts that could really uh, transform communities by looking more um, creatively at the role of the county in adding value to those communities. And uh, Commissioner Roger, uh, Roger Cooley needs some help in leading that charge. And anyone who is willing to take that on, I think you would find it most gratifying. So whether now or after this meeting, if you'd reach out to either him or me and express your interest, we would uh, be most appreciative. So thank you for raising that, Roger. Great. And then I think the next follow-up is um, to set the a conversation with Commissioner Flores and some of the other the, at the Bureau of Asset Management and the Land Bank for kind of presenting the concept and seeing, exploring some options for what is already happening and how to complement and explore yeah. that as well. So let's make a day, Commissioner Flores, when you're available, ready, interested, let's do all that. And I did reach out to the Land Bank uh, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna line up that participation as well as part of this. So thank you for that. Great. Um, so excited for those. Okay. Well, thank you. And we're gonna, we're gonna get you some uh, leadership help to really um, help uh, realize the full potential of what you have on your platter. And, and thank you for I guess that. One other thing is um, starting to think about doing some other outreach to. University partners to yes. potentially get some either graduate or other supports for kind of doing research, drafting policy briefs, um, kind of sketching out um, some of the to do some of the kind of moving the work forward in between sessions. Yeah, we do in fact have a uh, connection with the Harris School where they're offering up uh, that sort of assistance. So we need to kind of uh, frame what help we want and then okay. we can. Make the appropriate uh, uh, approach and request. Thank you for that. Yeah, so Commissioner Cooley, if we can maybe uh, chat and try to see if we can get a job description or something up, Great. just so that we abide by um, our BHR rules here, just due to Shackman, we want to make sure that we're not yeah. violating that. So we'll we'll be in touch and we can help you through that process and then get you situated so we can uh, uh, put that ask out there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. And I, I believe Commissioner Freeman is participating virtually. So, is that still true? So Commissioner Freeman did have to jump off, but she did say that there are some updates in the, uh, since the last uh, meeting in regards to their um, working group. Um, so we'll have to circle back. Later. Yeah, and, and Commissioner Raymer, unfortunately, was unable to be with us. So uh, the, um, the working group on community investment vehicles, we can anticipate a substantive, impressive, and empowering report at our next meeting from them. Is there any other working group that uh, would uh, like to report on progress? Because those are the three that I was aware of for today's meeting. Um, if not, I will defer to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. So we'll continue with the uh, regular um, order of business. We had uh, general updates um, from the Chair and Vice Chair. 
The only uh, update that, that we have is that we did have our first um, workshop um, a few weeks ago. Um, it was um, on the far northwest side. So we were in Franklin Park. We were welcomed by the mayor um, and some of the organizations that do um, work there. We did live stream it. Um, we recognized that it was quite far for some folks that had reached out and were interested and maybe couldn't make it. So we live streamed it on our Facebook page. Um, we had uh, Mark present. Um, and uh, if, if you all want to you know, take a look at it and see what we were talking about. This was a capacity building workshop um, for non for profits. So um, a lot of information was um, shared. We also had uh, Valerie Leonard, who was a previous commission um, commissioner here on the commission. Um, so it was, it was great. If you all want to again check it out, it is on the Cook County uh, Commission on Social Innovation Facebook page, and it can be shared there as well. So if you know anybody that may be interested in that information um, and we'll keep you updated on any of the follow up ones that we're going to be having. Those are going to be um, the first one will be in the south, uh, the southern suburbs, and then we'll be doing one, I believe, in the western suburbs. So we'll make sure to keep the commission in, in the loop and send any flyers um, as those things become to um, they materialize and we get those information. Um, other than that, I do not have any other updates. Mr. Chairman, did you yeah, have anything and else? I would, I would really like to uh, thank the chair for uh, her leadership in uh, facilitating these capacity building workshops. Um, they're being done in concert with uh, a 501c3 organization called Social Enterprise Chicago, which I'm privileged to serve as president and chair. And uh, Valerie Leonard, who many of you know, uh, runs uh, nonprofit Utopia. And she's very much an expert on many aspects of nonprofit management and operations. Spoke as did I. I talked about some of the legal issues and entity design choices and business models uh, surrounding earned revenue for nonprofits that wish to become more financially sustainable. And uh, so this is something that we had done. Years ago, uh, when uh, uh, Congressman Chuy Garcia was then the chair of this commission, and uh, I'm delighted that uh, Chair Anaya has uh, picked this up and is running with it as well. And we should be doing these, hopefully, in the fullness of time, all over the county. And we invite you, one to attend such capacity building workshops when convenient. And beyond that, if there are areas of the county where you'd like to see uh, presentations of this nature, uh, we would be uh, thrilled to add them to our uh, to our itinerary. So, so I mentioned that. Uh, one other uh, upcoming event I, I'd like to mention is the same organization, Social Enterprise Chicago, will be hosting a fireside chat on June 28th, where I will be sitting down with. Uh, Kate Baker, who is the new provost of the University of Chicago. And uh, apropos of today's session, the topic is going to focus on um, healthcare reform and implications for social impact, lifting up communities and leaving no one behind. And uh, so she and I are going to sit down and talk for an hour or so, uh, free ranging conversation, we will let it go. Uh, but it also will include uh, significant networking and food and drink will be present for those who are also present. And it's going to be June 28th. Uh, technically, it begins at five. The real action starts at six. Uh, networking in advance and following. And uh, love to have you there if you're if you're interested. Uh, you'll see announcements within uh, my Facebook or LinkedIn uh, pages and other social media uh, distribution channels. So that should be uh, a lot of fun. This is the third in a series. Uh, the first was with, uh, I sat down with Governor Pat Quinn, and uh, the second in March was I sat down with uh, Mike Stradmanis of the Obama Foundation. And we'll have two more this year after the one in June. Uh, one is going to be with uh, Andrea Sainz, who's the president and CEO of Chicago Community Trust. And then uh, 
TJ Augustin, who is the Vice Chancellor for Innovation at the University of Illinois. So they're all fun, a lot of opportunity to meet people, exchange ideas, um, learn from one another, and maybe even do business together. Who knows? Stranger things have happened. So we'd love to have you there on June 28th and beyond. So uh, that is the extent of, uh, of my report, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, are there any announcements from any of the members? Any additional events or anything that they'd like to? Okay. okay. With that, I just want to, one final thing, I just want to make sure to thank my staff today. They got the mics working. So thank you so much to Irene, who's here, and also Andrea, who uh, make sure that uh, the space is available, mics are working, cameras are on, um, and then we're ready to go. So with that said, I'll um, ask for a motion to adjourn, moved by Commissioner Flores, second by Commissioner DeVoe. Um, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, say I have it, and we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Be well and stay safe, everybody. Thanks for participating. Okay.